So in 1 Samuel chapter 17, you can't really uh, talk about this chapter, or preach this chapter rather, without going into a little bit about this man Goliath. You know, this is probably one of, if not the most popular uh, chapter in the Old Testament. It's definitely, you know, up there, top five, you know. And it's a great story, very famous story. And there's really a lot here. There's a lot of application that can be made. There's really, there's too much here to do even in one or two nights. There's so many things we could talk about tonight. But I wanted to start, you know, go, uh, just start out by pointing out just some things about Goliath. You know, the things that the kids are really going to be interested in, and probably even some of you adults, right? And that would be his physical stature, you know. And, and, and Goliath, when we really look at what he is, you know, he was quite the foe. I mean, he, this, was, this isn't a small task that, uh, you know, David accomplished here. You know, I, I, I would wonder how, how, where we would fall in the story if we were there. Those of us that think we're so strong and mighty and, and we, we know we have all this, this ability. If we were faced with a guy like this, you know, physically like Goliath, you know, would we, would we have this, you know, David-like courage to go and, and to take him on? Or would we be more like, you know, th these other guys that are kind of cowering? Now, you, you know, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, okay? So you, 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 know, you know who you are out there, but... But, I mean, I'm just trying to make the point that this was really something. And you, when you talk about Goliath, of course, um, for sake of time, we'll just kind of jump through into, uh, you know, th well, through the first four verses. It says, Now the Philistines gathered themselves together with the armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko. And you know the story. And the Philistine, in verse 3, stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them, and there went on a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. So, the first thing you can see about this guy is he was very tall, and that's why he's referred to as a giant. And, you know, if you, uh, if you, if you actually measure this out, he's about nine feet, nine inches. You know, a, a, uh, a, a cubit is about a, a foot and a half, and then, you know, a span is about nine inches, I believe. So that works out to about nine foot, nine inches. I mean, that's taller than the ceiling. You know, I, I, I failed to grab a measuring tape, but I'm thinking, you know, if you just paste that out, like, this is his feet. You know, imagine him laying down, obviously. You know, there's three feet, there's six feet, you know, there's nine feet. He's like, he's somewhere out here, you know, he's a pretty tall guy. It's kind of hard to see that because, you know, laying down, but, I mean, he'd be through the ceiling tonight. And in and previous sermons where we talked about uh, the, the other giant that's mentioned, um, you know, we measured him out. And they're not, they're not these huge creatures that some people try, you know, the, the Nephilim or whatever that people try to make up, you know, out on, on internet land. People that get into, on YouTube, that spend more time, you know, on YouTube than actually reading their Bible. You know, they get mixed up in this stuff. The, the Bible does talk about giants, but, you know, it calls Goliath the giant, and he was nine feet, nine inches tall. You know, and, and I'm telling you, if you get around a person who's that tall, or, you know, a taller person, you know, you, you consider them a giant. You get the feeling of why they would call somebody that tall a giant. That's very tall, by the way. And I mean, uh, I, I was in the presence of one that you know, is often referred to as a giant, and Pastor Aaron Thompson recently. You know, and I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm told, you know, I'm a big guy. I'm not a, I'm not the, I'm above average height. You know, I'm 6'2". But when I get around Pastor Thompson, I feel like a little guy. I mean, I'm, I'm doing this. And he's 6'7", or 6'8", I think. He's only got a few inches on me. Well, more than a few. But, you know, he makes me feel small. And he's, you know, just, just a little bit bigger. You know, well, about in there. <laughs> You know, that's why I call him Pastor Thompson, you know, but, uh, or Sir, at the very least. But imagine nine feet nine. I mean, add like another three feet to that. I mean, that much taller, you know, that's, that's a big guy. You know, the, the taller they get, typically the wider they get, right? That's, that's, at least that's the truth in my, the, 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 you know, that's how it is with me. That's my case, right? I mean, when you think about some of the giants of today, you know, think about, here's a throwback for some of you guys, Andre the Giant, right? That's okay. You know, you don't have to be that worldly to know who Andre the Giant is, right? Probably people who have never even seen wrestling or watched a single match probably know who Andre the Giant. I mean, when you're going by that name, Andre the Giant, it's for a reason. And that's because that guy was seven foot four. But he's still, I mean, Goliath, he'd get around Goliath, and Goliath would call him a shrimp. Now, have you ever seen that guy? You know, Andre the Giant was a massive man, huge guy. And, I mean, he had all, it just, you know, just getting around trying to live a normal life when you're that big is very difficult. I mean, imagine being this guy, you know, Goliath. Even uh, the tallest person in recorded in medical history is the na a man by the name of Robert Waldo. And he was 8 foot 11. That's a big boy, too. 
But Goliath is nine feet, nine inches tall. The guy's almost 10 feet tall. In fact, the tallest person currently living is a guy named, I'm probably, yeah, I think he's a Swede. I'm going to butcher his name. It's Sultan Kosin, I think. But he's eight feet, two inches tall. And again, you know, he's still, he's still not even, he's a full sh uh, foot shorter than Goliath was. Goliath was a very tall person. And then you get into his armor, right? And th this is a fearsome foe that David is going up against. And we'll make some application here in a minute. <clears throat> and it says in verse 5, And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. Now, I don't know exactly, you know, I don't think anyone can really give you the exact, you know, um, uh, what would you call it, the, uh, the, the weight, the, you know, how many, how many shekels to pounds. They couldn't really make that accurately. Maybe they could, I don't know. But I kind of, you know, you go on Google, you find these calculators, and you just trust them, right? And if it sounds impressive enough, you put it in your sermon, <laughs> which is like I've done tonight. So the weight of the coat, according to Google, right? You know, there, there's the caveat, asterisk, you know? But the Bible's mentioning the weight for a reason. It's, trying to, it's not just like you saying it, you know, because, you know, we're just, we're curious. He wants you to know this guy was big, and he had, you know, big armor. And he was, it was, it's approximately 125 pounds. And that's just the coat of mail that he puts on, like the armor is 125 pounds. I mean, that's like a person. <laughs> you know, it's like putting another person on you. you know, it's pr and honestly, I think it was probably heavier than that. I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's a shekels of brass, and brass is a very heavy, heavy uh, metal. Verse 6, it says, and he had greaves of brass upon his legs. Now, he's walking with the, I mean, I mean, I, as a locksmith, when I was a locksmith, thing, you know, we would save all the, the, the brass keys. You know, all the, most house keys are made out of brass. And we would, every, you know, junk key that we got, we would throw in a five-gallon pail. And we'd fill up five-gallon pails full of brass keys. And you'd go to take that to the scrapyard, man. It was, you were grabbing a dolly to, to move that thing around. It's very heavy. I mean, it was 80, 90 pounds or whatever, just, just for that. But this guy here, this Goliath, he's putting greaves of brass upon his legs. You know, some kind of armor probably down on his shins, maybe on his thighs, and he's just walking around with them. You know, I remember having to wear work boots, you know, with steel toes in them. And sometimes, I'd, you know, after a long day, I'd take those things off, and you could feel the weight come off your feet just from the weight of the boots. I can't imagine what this guy, you know, it's like when you're, uh, you know, you jump on a trampoline, then you start walking, and it feels really weird. Who knows what I'm talking about? Can you imagine this guy going home and taking the brass greaves off his legs and just feeling lighter than air? Yeah. You know, just like, whoa, was, you know, it must have been a crazy feeling. But this is how big this guy was. He's just throwing on 125 pounds. He's just throwing on some brass greaves on his legs and just walking around and, and going to war with him, which is a very physical activity. I mean, he's running, he's charging, he's battling, he's doing all this with all this immense amount of weight on his body. I mean, I can't, you, I'm just trying to paint the picture for you tonight of what David was really up, up against. You know, we hear these stories and we go, oh yeah, David and Goliath. You need to really think about that giant sometimes. Really think about who Goliath was. This is a really an, an amazing thing that David did. took a lot of courage and a lot of faith. <laughs> I mean, there's a reason why all the other men of Israel are hiding in the trees in the story. But it says he had a target of brass between his shoulders, just brass everywhere. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his, spears, uh, and his spear's head was 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him. I mean, I bet the guy bearing the shield was probably a big dude. I mean, you're carrying Goliath's shield around. That's not, you know, that's not, you're not going to hire some weakling to do that. It's going to take somebody pretty, probably pretty buff. But the weight of the spear head, you know, if, again, you know, if you can trust these calculators and things, and was about 15 pounds. So he's, he's carrying around this, that's just the spear head of iron. And you, just, you know, you say oh, 15 pounds isn't that much. See how far you can throw 15 pounds. Yeah. Now throw it with force to try and throw it through another human being. You know, like, that's what the spear's for. You know, he's impaling people with this thing. And, he's, and that's just on the tip, and he's just waving it around out there. I mean, go home tonight and grab a five-pound dumbbell, if you got one, and just hold it out. And see how long you can do that. It sounds easy. That gets tiring. But this guy's got 15 pounds just kind of, whoop, you know, waving it around. So, he's, you know, this, you can see why people are referring to this guy as a giant, Right? And, I'm, and I'm saying all this because you know, the Bible does define what a giant is for us. And it basically, it's talking about a person of great stature or height. Right? Now go over to Deuteronomy chapter 3. 
You, know, you can see this all throughout the Bible. This isn't an isolated uh, you know, use of the word of giant or you know, talking about people who have this great height and, and size. In Numbers chapter 13, you're going to Deuteronomy 3, but it talks about you know, when, they, when they went into the land, uh, to, to the, they sent the spies into the promised land to spy out the land. And remember, the ten guys came back with the evil report. The report was they saw men, are that, and, and the people that we saw in it are men of great stature, right? Meaning they were very tall, and, we, and, they were, and, and there we saw the giants. That's what he's talking about. People, a giant is just a very tall person, right? The sons of Anak, which, which come of the giants, which, and, then it, and it says, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Now, you can't take that literally. And that's where some peop, you know, people get caught up in these bozo doctrines. Right. They say, oh, they were as grasshoppers in their sight. And they take that literally. It's an expression. It's a figure of speech. You know, it feels silly to even have to say it. But you know what? It's out there. And people get mixed up, and people hear these type of things. And, and, and people read the Bible, and, it's, and they don't connect the dots here. Like, this is not, they weren't literally that tall. That would be a very tall person. To make me, like someone our size, an average size human being, to feel like, to literally be a grasshopper? You know how big you'd have to be? It'd be very big. It would, it would be gigantic it, in, the, in the most extreme terms, right? You'd be a very big person. It's not realistic. That's not at all what it's talking about. He's just saying, look, they were very big. And you have to remember the source here. These are ten guys that are afraid to go to battle, that are lacking in faith, and are trying to convince everybody not to go. So they're using these great you know, figures of speech, trying to, you know, oh, you don't understand. We're like grasshoppers over there. You know, they're trying to frighten everybody. Deuteronomy 2, the Bible says, And the Emims dwelt there in time past of people great and many and, and tall, and as the Anakims, which also were counted as giants. So to be a giant in the Bible just means you're tall. It just means you're of great stature. Look at Deuteronomy 3, verse 8. And it says, And we took at that time out of the hand of the two kings of the Amorites, the land which was on the other side of Jordan, from the river of Arnon unto the Mount Hermon. Uh, just jump down to, uh, I'll just go to verse 10. And the cities of the plain and all Gilead and all Bashan and Salak and Edrei, cities of the kingdom of Og and Bashan. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the rem remnant of the giants. So this guy, uh, you know, when we went through Deuteronomy, talked about him. He was considered a giant in the Bible, right? And his bedstead was a bedstead of iron, is it not in Rabath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof. So it gives you, again, another dimension to describe, you know, not the giant, but his bed. And his bed, if you break down the math, is about 13 and a half feet long. Now, that would be about the right size for a guy in that 9 to 10 foot, you know, a Goliath. You know, because you get a big bed, you want to stretch out. <coughs> so this kind of, you know, this all really just debunks this whole stupid doctrine of the Nephilim. And if you would, go over to... Uh, well, you know what? Just go over to 2 Samuel chapter 21. And I, I'm not going to belabor the point. I don't, I don't think... It, you know, if you're struggling with the doctrine of the Nephilim, just come see me after the service, and we'll, we'll hash it out, okay? We'll talk about it. But, it talk, you know, there are key verses back in Genesis. I won't have you go there for the sake of time. In Jeff, Genesis chapter 6, where it talks about how uh, when, the, when the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, that they went in unto them. And, uh, and, and it says in verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, that for that he is also flesh. Yet his days shall be in 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And people, you know, they just jump to this conclusion and say, Well, see, the sons of, gods are, are, the sons of God are angels. That's a whole other sermon. You know, we could debunk that. And, and, and talking about how they were going in and, and intermarrying with women and then this strange hybrid species was born, and they became, and that's why it says there were giants in the earth in those days. That's not what it's talking about at all. In fact, the chronology of the Bible, you know, debunks it. And not, e not even to mention the fact that, you know, that God is the author of all life. You know, God, he, he, so if this was, if this happened, if the sons of God were these fallen angels that went in unto women and then produced these hybrid strange creatures that turned into giants that were, you know, 400 stories tall and eyeballs as big of, as a car, you know, and everything else. Imagine trying to make clothes for those type of people, right? You know, if, if that was what was going place, that means God's responsible for that. That God's the one that made them. Because the Bible talks about how the fact that, you know, the fruit of the womb is his reward. God's the one that gives life. So that's one argument you could take with it. You know, and I don't believe God, you know, it's a silly, it's a stupid doctrine. You know, there's one way of debunking it. How about the fact that the, the, their key verse, you know, the chronology of, it, chronology of it actually proves that giants are not the hybrid offspring of women and angels. 
because it says, and also after that, that there were giants also earth in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, they bare children to them. So the giants pre-existed the sons of God. Angels are not, you know, intermarrying with the daughters of men. <coughs> and if God is punishing, you know, the earth for these giants that are in the earth, then why do they still exist after the flood? Like God must have missed one or something, or a giant, you know, a couple of giants you know, dressed up as a giraffe and snuck in on the ark, you know. <laughs> that's not what happened, you know. And that's not why God was punishing them. It's a dumb doctrine. Goliath and his sons are considered giants. And if you read through uh, 2 Samuel chapter 21, I got a lot of notes, so I'm going to try and, and hurry through this. But if you read through Genesis, or excuse me, 2 Samuel 21, you, you, you read through beginning of verse 16, you know, you, you'll read about how you know, the, the giant of Gath, you know, he had, Goliath, he had several sons. And he had a brother as well. He had four sons and a brother. And, it, uh, and look at verse 22. It says, these four were born to the giant in Gath. So the Bible calls Goliath a giant. That's what he was. And he's only, he doesn't even break 10 feet tall. That's as tall as, as a, a giant gets. But I want us to kind of notice something here in Second Chain chapter 21. It says in verse 16, and Ishbinebab was of the was of the sons of the giant, and the weight of his uh, of whose spear weighed three hundred shekels of brass and weight. He, being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. So this is the son of Goliath, who wants to get vengeance on David for having killed his father. But Abishai, the son of Zariah, succored him, succored David. Right? I mean, he came to his aid, protected him, he succored him, and smote the Philistine. So he goes ahead and killed him. Then the men of uh, David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle. Thou shalt not quench the light of Israel. And it came to pass after this that there, were again, uh, there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then uh, Sibachai, the, uh, the Hushathite, slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant. And there was, a, a, uh, there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Jerah Gorgium, a Bethlehemite slew of the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was yet a battle in Gath, and there was a man of a great stature that had on his hand, every hand six fingers, and on every, toe, every foot six toes, four and twenty in number. And he also was born to the giant. And, these, and when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, the brother of David, slew him. So it's an interesting story here in, in 2 Samuel. You know, towards the latter end of David's life where he's gotten older. And now, they're say, now the men that are around him are saying, look, you're not going to go out to battle anymore. You know, and they go out and they t kill these other giants. And what I want to talk to you about tonight is, is the fact that, you know, every generation has to face their own giant. You know, they couldn't just count on David to slay every giant that was out there. In fact, it, it's what I'm reading in this story in 2 Samuel, it sounds to me like David might not have been up to the task at that point. I mean, it, certainly the Lord could have come upon him and used him, but they were, he had gotten older in age, and they're saying, look, you don't need to go out and fight these battles anymore. We've, you know, you've been our leader. You've, seen the, you, uh, you've shown us how to fight these battles. We're going to go out and fight them as well. And I want to talk about tonight that there's a giant for every generation. There is a giant to be slain for every generation. And this giant can take, you know, Many different forms, and we'll talk a little about that tonight, but what I'm trying to get across tonight is the fact that those of us that are fighting today, you know, those of us that are fighting the spiritual fight today, like David was, will one day to be too old to properly fight the giants of tomorrow. You know, one day, you know, even as I think about this as a preacher, you know, God willing, if I'm able to continue the ministry, you know, uh, into my old age, there's probably going to come a point where I just don't have the physical strength or maybe even the mind to get up and preach and deliver and feed God's people like I need to. You know, I'm going to have to retire from that fight. And there's no shame in that. You know, that's just a natural, cor you know, natural course of events in a person's life. People grow old, they get weaker, and it's, it's proper and fitting that in their elder years, you know, they just kind of, you know, I'm not saying they just quit, they quit the fight altogether, but they don't maybe do as much as they were able to do in their strength, right. in their youth. So that's what I'm saying tonight, is that those of us that are fighting today, and this could go for, you know, the folks in the pew tonight, too. Those of us that are raising godly families, those of us that are going out and preaching the gospel, those of us that are just trying to fight the spiritual warfare today of living the Christian life, one day, 
you know, we're, we're going to be too old to fight some of the battles that need to be, fight, need to be fought tomorrow. And, uh, you know, another example of this is the fact that, you know, preachers of the past, they fought a different battle than the one we fight today. You ever listen to, and I'm talking about good preachers. I'm talking about preachers who got up and preached the whole counsel of the Word of God. You know, a lot of times you listen to that preaching, you don't hear a lot of preaching in the Sodomites. That's one example you know, I'm, I'm using. And why is that? It's because back then the Sodomites were still in the closet. Yeah. That, that battle didn't need to be fought the way it needs to be fought today. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not just, you know, they were, they were just trying to take it easy on them. It's just, I, I'd imagine there's a lot of old-time preachers that would, get, that would be just flabbergasted by what they saw today. If they were to sit down and watch, you know, a television program and look at some of the, the commercials that are out there. These commercials where they have, you know, faggots on them. Literally kissing on the, on the television. The, parade, the filth that's just being paraded up and down in every city in America. They could never probably even envision America getting to the point that it's at today. What I'm trying to say is that that wasn't their battle because it wasn't going on. They had different battles. But we have battles today. We have to fight that battle. Say, boy, you guys bring up the sodomites a lot in your churches. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's being shoved in our face yeah. all the time. Yeah. You can't go anywhere without having to see this filth anymore. It's everywhere. Their agenda is just being pushed and pushed and pushed and accepted. And you know what? That's a battle that we have to fight today. Yeah. But you know what? That maybe that, I don't know how long that battle's going to go on, you know, maybe until Jesus comes. But there's going to come a day where somebody else is going to have to take up that mantle and fight that battle. There's going to be, or maybe it's going to be another giant that we can't foresee. Maybe there's going to be some other abomination or some other false doctrine or whatever it is that needs to be preached against. Somebody else is going to have to take a stand and, and take up the mantle and fight that battle, fight that giant. You know, David couldn't slew, I mean, he wanted to. We'll see that in a minute. David, but he didn't kill all the giants. Somebody else had to go take care of the rest. And what I'm saying tonight is that there's a battle, there's a giant for every generation. You know, we have ours, and we're fighting that battle. So how are you going to fight this battle? How are you going to fight this giant? Well, one, you need to know your enemy. Go over to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. You need to know who you're up against. And I'm, I'm telling you tonight, the battle is real, and the enemy is strong. You know, we don't ever want to, you know, let him that thinketh he stand to take heed lest he fall. You know, a lot of people are getting very laxical, lackadaisical today in their Christianity. Just saying, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Look, it's a big deal. Oh, the enemy is not that. No, the enemy is strong. You know, and the Christian life is a fight. It's a battle. And a lot of times today, a lot of Christians, they get way too comfortable with the world. And they, and they let other people fight the battle. And they don't want to join in. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. What's the Christian life? The, the Christian life is a fight, spiritually speaking. It is a battle. You know, why else do you, how else do you explain when, when people get taken out? People fall out of the Christian life all the time. They give up on God. They quit reading their Bibles. They quit soul winning. They quit praying. And they just kind of go through life. They just coast. Not fighting any battles. You run into them. You go out and you knock on doors and you, you talk to people. Oh, yeah, I'm saved. I got saved when I was younger. Going to church anywhere? Nope. Just doing nothing for God. Look, those are people that have lost the battle, that have, have been defeated spiritually. And that's all the devil needs to do. Just get you out of the fight. Just take you out. <clears throat> the Christian life is a fight. Why else would Paul tell Timothy, fight the good fight of faith? Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. We all know this passage. Verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Why, is there need to, why do you need to be strong in the Lord today? Because there's a Goliath out there that must be fought. You know what? Maybe, maybe that Goliath isn't just, you know, some sin in our society. Maybe that Goliath is a sin in your life. Maybe there's some sin in our lives that we need to get victory over once and for all. And look, some sins can be very powerful in our lives. You know, addiction is a very powerful thing. We can get addicted to all kinds of different things today. And whatever that is, you know, that could be a Goliath in a person's life. And you know what? You're going to need strength. Where are you going to get that strength? You have to be strong in the Lord. But I'm trying to get you to understand, first of all, is that you need to know your enemy. Acknowledge that there is one that the Christian life is a fight, that there is a battle, that you have an enemy, and that that enemy is strong. Right. He says, put on the whole armor of God, that you may not be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's our fight. That sounds like quite a foe. Spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, principalities, powers. That's, that's our fight. It's not a carnal fight. 
You know, you're not going to go find, you know, some physical fight to get into for the Lord. You know, that's, it's just not out there. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking, and you say, well, you know, that sounds a lot more scary. That sounds a lot more dangerous. But it isn't. It's actually the exact opposite. That's the easy fight. Yeah. To go mix it up physically with some whatever, you know, go get in a scrap with somebody. You know, eventually both guys gas and, you know, they brush it off and they lick their wounds and they move on with their life. But the spiritual battles, those are ones that can just take people out completely. And people can just make such a mess and such a wreck out of their life spiritually that they're just done. They're just going to go limping through the rest of their Christian life, wounded and, un and just not able to, to fight like they should have been able to. Look, how, how is the next generation going to fight the Goliaths, the, the giants that are going to come their way? First, they have to understand that there really is an enemy, that he's real, and that it's up to them to fight it. Because, you know, you can't just always rely on David. You can't just rely on the fact that the preacher fought and that mom and dad fought. Eventually, you know, the next generation has to say, this is our fight now. Thank you for leading the way, David. Thank you for taking the charge, for inspiring us, for motivating us, to show us how it's done. We've got it from here. We'll take care of it. That's what needs to happen from generation to generation to generation. You know, and that's a very important thing because of the fact that you see it all the time in Scripture where the next generation doesn't follow through. You know, they, they, they ride on the coattails of the previous generation, their faith, and then when it becomes their turn to gird on the armor and go out and face the enemy, they're not up for it, or they just don't want to, or they go join the other side, even. That happens all the time in Scripture. And that's why we need to make sure that we remind ourselves about this fact that every generation has a giant to face. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I mean, if you're getting in a spiritual fight, which is what the Christian life is, you know, there's going to be some hardness. There's going to be some difficulty. In fact, go over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. You're pretty close there. Keep something in Ephesians 6. Sorry, I should have told you that. We're going to come back a little bit later, but in 2 Timothy chapter 2, he says, endure hardness. You know why a lot of people don't want to fight? Because it's hard. You know why a lot of preachers and a lot of churches just want to roll over for the sodomites and for everything else? For any, they don't want to ever take a hard stand on anything ever because it's hard. Because it's a fight. Because somebody might actually get hurt. Because they don't want, you know, they don't want them standing outside their door waving their signs and, 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 and everything else like they, like, they, like they do. They're afraid of that. It's hard. You know why some people want to quit serving the Lord? Because it's hard. It's difficult. The world's tempting us, the flesh is tempting us, the devil's there. It is a battle. It's hard. It's gonna, you're going to have to endure that hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 4. He says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. You know, sometimes Goliath is a very obvious giant. Goliath is a hard guy to miss, isn't he? I mean, if Goliath walked in the room, we'd all know it. I mean, he's a, he was a big guy. He stood out like a sore thumb. But you know what? The, the, the enemies that we face, they're not these big glaring giants. They're like, oh, that's clearly the enemy. Look, he's saying here, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. You know, sometimes the affairs of this life can be that enemy. I mean, that's what Jesus taught. He said, you know, the parable of the sower. You know, some seed fell upon what? Thorny, uh, upon uh, thorny, and thorny ground, right? And the, and the ground, it, it sprung up, and then the thorns, what were the thorns that choked out that, that seed? It was the cares and the riches of this life. People who get, get caught up with the affairs of this life, they get so concerned about, you know, just the affairs of this life. Things that aren't, have no eternal value. You know, careers, money, whatever it might be, just pleasures of this life hobbies, just enjoying life, just moving through life, just taking it easy. You know, and that's really easy to do, especially in America, isn't it? There's a lot of things that we could just spend our time enjoying, a lot of hobbies we could take on, a lot of just ways to just go have fun and frivolously just waste a whole life. Get entangled with the affairs of this life and get our eyes off of the battle that we are all called to fight. You say, well, what's the harm in that? Oh, I don't know. Then there's just some spiritual Goliath that comes in and just, you know, runs roughshod over an entire society, a total nation. 
because no one's willing to stand up and fight because they're too busy getting caught up in the affairs of this life. They don't want to fight. They don't want to go to war because it's hard. Because it might actually cost you something to stand for God. So you need to understand, you know, if every, if every generation is going to face their giant, you have to know your enemy and you know, acknowledge that he exists, that it's real, that it's out there, that it's a spiritual fight, and that that giant is strong. You know, Paul, uh, Peter said, be sober, be vigilant, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And every time I read that or preach that, I always think of the, the time I heard somebody preach that and say, oh, but the devil's a defeated foe. He's a toothless lion. You know, I get what you're trying to say, that the, 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 we, the victory is ours in Christ Jesus. But in the meantime, it says who he may devour. Yeah, right. Meaning he has the ability to devour people. And, you know, he always goes at, who do, the, who do lions go after in, in the physical world? The weak, right? The sickly, those that aren't strong and, 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 and exercising themselves. That's who the devil goes after as a roaring lion. And believe me, he is able to devour who, he, who, who will let him. He says, whom resist steadfast in the faith. You know, that's, that's the Christian life. That's the battle is a lot of times it's just resisting. I'm not going to give in to that temptation I'm not going to let uh, the devil get me off this path. Whatever it is, I'm not going to just let the, 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 the enemy win. You know, we have a giant. Every generation has a giant to face. That giant is strong. That giant is real. And that giant is bold. Go back to second temp, or second, uh, or excuse me, 1 Samuel, rather, 17. It says in verse 8 of, 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 of Goliath, And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said to them, why are you come out to set your battle in array? And he's very bold. He's just standing there like, what are you guys doing here? Who wants to fight? He's out there picking a fight. He said, am I not a Philistine and ye servants of Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. I mean, he's putting it all on the line. He's willing to just put it all out there and challenge God's people. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye shall be uh, our servants and serve us. <laughs> Do you notice there was no neutral ground here? It wasn't like, and if there's a tie, you know, we'll just both go our own ways. Look, there is no neutral ground. And, that, you know, there's an enemy today. That, that's exactly the way the enemy is today. You know, and I'll just bring it up again. The Sodomites. They, that's how exactly, they're bold. They go out there now and they just hold their signs. Preach love, not hate. You know, you Christians aren't like Jesus. Blah, blah, or whatever they say, you know. We were up in Portland, and we had, I probably already told this joke on Sunday, but the one had a, had a respirator on, and she said it like this, and she's getting in Pastor Tapson's face, telling her that the Bible says this, and we nicknamed her Bane, you know, like the, the character. <laughs> oh, you know, talking about, I was born in darkness. <laughs> you know, he's like, amen to that, you are, you know, you are the servant of darkness, <clears throat> Bane. But that's how the enemy is, isn't, isn't it? They're bold. Just like this, this Philistine of Gath. I mean, he's just out there. I defy the armies of the living God. That's exactly the way the enemy is today. That's what the, the, the giant that we're facing today is like. They just stand out there and say, I defy you. I ch and they're challenging God's people to a fight. Oh, there's an invite on my door? So, looks like they want to mix it up. You know, they, they, they mess with the wrong faggot this time. <laughs> Their words, by the way. And, and they want to go down there and... And get in a fight. That's what they do. They want to challenge anyone to come and defy them. And they're expecting everybody to back down. You know why that is? Because a lot of people are. Because a lot of people are just backing right down and saying, oh, let's not upset them. Because they're loud and they're obnoxious and they look big and scary. But it's all an illusion. They're really not that strong. But that's, you know, that's the, the, the giant is bold. The enemy that we have to face today in this generation is a very bold giant. And, you know, they're emboldened by the fact that nobody's fighting them. And he ends in verse 10, says, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. And he's out there for 40 days just saying, is there anyone, is there no one that will fight me? Just challenging him. And you know what? There was nobody. Every time they saw him, they're like, oh, there he is. Oh. And they're running and hiding. And that's the same. And that just emboldens the enemy more. And that's why it's so much more important that you stand, even if it means having to stand alone against that giant. Because that will back them down. That, at least they'll be that much less bold. But when there's just nobody, there's just no resistance at all, right. and they're just, they're just going to be even more emboldened. 
<clears throat> and why is it that there's nobody there to fight? Because the giant scares most people. Most people are just scared to death of, of, of having to actually get in a fight and, and mix it up. <clears throat> it says in verse 11, when Saul and Israel heard all the words, of the, all those, excuse me, and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. But what does the Bible say? That when we come up against a giant, when we come up against the enemy, when somebody's defying Christ, who's defying God, who's defying the Bible, God's people, you know, is that, is that the attitude we should have? Like, oh, well, you know, he is big and scary. Maybe we should just kind of let him do his thing over there. No. The Bible says in 2 Timothy, God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. God hasn't given us this, this spirit of, of, of wanting to back down and just let the giant have his way. God has given us a, a, you know, a spirit of boldness, a spirit of a sound mind it's like, that understands, look, I can take this fight on. In fact, it's my duty to fight. God calls us to fight this fight. He says in Matthew chapter 10, What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye on the rooftops. He doesn't want us to hide the light under a candle, or excuse me, a light under a bushel. He doesn't want us to hide the light. He wants us to let our light shine before men. And so many people today, they're afraid to just let what they believe shine. You know, whether it's, you know, you know publicly from a pulpit, or whether it's, you know, in your personal life, you know, we don't want to let the people at work know that we're Christian. Otherwise, we might, you know, they might ask what church we go to. Or, you know, then we'd have to tell them. And then they might Google it. And they might find out what our pastor believes. And that he's been banned from 32 countries. And that he's, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's uh, you know, he's, he's on the, the, some list somewhere as a hate group. Woo! You know, that's like the big threat. You're a registered hate group. Yeah. Like, Okay. And we'll consider the source, you know, the Southern Poverty Law Center. <laughs> it's not exactly, you know, fair and balanced over there. <laughs> what is anymore? But, you know, Jesus is saying here, look, preach it on the housetops. And he said, and fear not them which kill the body. Even it came down to like an actual physical confrontation where you're going to lose your life for the cause of Christ. Even then he's saying, don't be afraid. And you know what? There's going to be a generation that that is what it comes down to. You know, I don't know if that's going to be our generation or my children or their children or how far down the line it's going to be, but there's going to come a time eventually when the Antichrist rises up and the tribulation starts and they go into the great tribulation and the devil is, set, is cast, down, cast out of heaven for the last time and he's come down with great wrath and knoweth that he has a short time and he makes war with the saints and the Bible says that he shall prevail. He's going to make war with the saints and he's going to win. And then except those days be short and there should be no flesh be saved. It's not, you know, there, it's a losing battle physically at that point. It might actually one day, and there's even places in the world today where being a Christian would cost you your life, potentially. There's a, that's a real possibility that if you went around, you know, being a Christian, it, you might have, you know, acid thrown in your face, you might, whatever, going to jail. It might actually cause you to be physically harmed in some way. Right. But did, did Jesus say, well, in that instance, you know, keep it to yourself. And he said, fear them not. You know, and it's easy for me to say that here in, in, in America because we really don't face, you know, that. You know, the worst we'll get is, you know, we might end up with a one-star rating on Google. <laughs> you know, maybe we'll end up on a, a, a five-minute news piece on, on the 11 o'clock news or something. We're not going to be, like, chained in some dungeon somewhere waiting to be beheaded right. like John the Baptist or something. But he says, you know, if you're not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's who you should be afraid of, is God. Go over to Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5. Look, every generation has a giant to face, and they have to understand that the giant is real, the giant is bold, and the giant is strong. That there's a battle that we all have to fight, even in our personal lives, against sin or, or whatever it might be. <coughs> and that, you know, we can't be afraid. To face these giants. Jeremiah chapter 1, look verse 7. Well, I, I had to go to Romans chapter 5, right? You in Romans 5? Yeah, no. Okay. But he told Jeremiah, look, he told him to go preach against a, you know, a, you know, a wicked generation in Jeremiah's day. He preached some hard sermons against some people that were not very receptive at all. Yeah. But he, what did he tell them? Be not afraid of their faces. He said, don't mind the looks that they're going to give you. Don't, don't, you know. Sometimes you'll say something or preach something and you could tell somebody doesn't like it. You know, 
You just, and then you tell yourself, eh, it's probably just, you know, indigestion or something. <laughs> right? That's what you tell yourself as a preacher. But you know what? A lot of times people are just like, or this is the worst, and they're just going, you know. <laughs> just kidding, I've never had that. <laughs> but look, God is, incur- you know, if God isn't having, you know, Jesus is saying, don't be afraid. He's telling Jeremiah, don't be afraid. You know what that tells me? And he's saying, look, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. Be strong. Fight the good fight of faith. You know, he's trying to encourage him. You know what that tells me? Is that fear is a natural reaction. You know, that, that you probably are going to experience fear at some point if you're going to fight these battles. There's going to be fear, an element of fear. You know, when, when I'm in, you know, I just keep going back to this recent experience because it's a good illustration. But in Vancouver, you know, Pastor Thompson, we're driving to the church that morning. And I know there's protesters. And maybe I experienced some slight PTSD or something. I don't know. When we had protesters up in Phoenix, I got the butterflies in my stomach. And then I come around the corner, and I see him, and I went, oh, this is nothing. And I, I was actually amused. But it, rem- it was like a flashback. I remember the first time we had, a, you know, 100-plus protesters out there making a big noise. I'm not going to get up and say, like, well, I, didn't, I wasn't nervous at all. Of course I was. You know, it didn't keep me from church. It didn't keep me from, from doing the right thing. But, you know, that's just a natural reaction, the adrenaline dump, you know, the butterflies in your stomach. When you get in a fight, you know, that's part of fighting is you, the adrenaline, the fear that flight or fight response. But what I'm trying to get, to, what you need to understand is this, is that fear dissipates with experience. Right. And that's what we saw. I should have, keep something in Romans. I know I got your fingers all over the place tonight, but go back to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And you say, how was it that David was able to just go up against such a foe? You know, and, I, and I'm, you read that story, you know, Saul, or uh, 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 Jesse, it says that he, he went as an old man meaning he was past the age that he, was, that he was to go to war. You know, God put a cap on that. And that, you know, you're 20 years old and up, you were, cons- you know, I think it's 20 to 50, you were considered a man of war. I could be wrong about that. I mean, that, was, that might just be the Levites. But you had to be at least 20 to go fight for, for Israel. So his three eldest went, meaning his other sons, you know, my interpretation is just my opinion is that they weren't even 20 years of age, which would make David very young in the story. You know, and I could be wrong about that, but that's the impression I get is that David is very, very young in this story. I mean, he's just, he's of a fair countenance. He's just, he's a, he's a young, young, young man. Probably in his early teens, is what I would say. How is that, a guy like that, going up against a guy who's nine feet nine, covered in brass, with a, just like this huge spear. All the, all the grown men around David are cowering in fear. I mean, trained men of Saul are just afraid. And David's just like, I'm taking this guy on. I'm not afraid of this guy. You know, how was he able to do that? It's because of all the experience he'd had leading up to this. Because you remember, he was, he's, at this point in the story, he's already been anointed by Saul, or excuse me, uh, um, Samson. Not Samson, Samuel. The name of the book that we're in, you know, Samuel. He's been anointed, and the Bible says that the, 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 the Spirit of God came upon him from that day forth. So he's got the Spirit of God on him, and I believe what he, what he does here... Uh, he recounts the story of the things that happened when he had the Spirit of God upon him. And it says in the words which David spake, where they rehearsed, verse 31, before, uh, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. I mean, put yourself in Saul's shoes. You know, you've got this guy who's just defying them for 40 days, and then this kid comes in, he's like, I got this. And you know what, everyone? Just be at ease. You know what? It's okay. I'm going to take care of this. I mean, Saul's probably just like, uh-huh. Oh, yeah. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine. He's, he immediately just writes him right off. Because, and, uh, you know, and can you really blame him? I mean, given, given just the appearances of the situation, I mean, if you just looked at it, cardinally speaking, you'd go, this guy doesn't stand a chance. Right. I mean, this kid is just going to go get slaughtered. And he gives him some reasons. He says, thou for thou art but a youth. You know, talking about how young he is. And he a man of war from his youth. You know, the Philistines started him a little earlier in the army. You know, he was like, you know, those, those African, you know, warlords that grab the little kids and teach them to, you know, start killing people, which is a tragedy, right? But, I mean, that's, that's, that's who this guy is. He's been, you know, fighting and training since he was just a kid. He says, he's a man of war from his youth. He's got way more experience than David. And, you know, it kind of leaves out the fact that he's nine feet tall. And covered in brass. He's just saying, he's just talking about the age factor alone. Then, then let's add in the fact that he's this giant 
and he's just well he's well armed and he knows what he's doing that he's not this is his first rodeo and David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. So he, now he's giving us the example. He's like saying, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't say, and David came to his senses and said, You know what, Saul? You're right. Thank you for talking me out of that. I don't know what I was thinking. He, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't say, he starts to give him the reasons. No, I got this. Here's why I'm going to win. Here's why David wasn't afraid to go fight this fight. Because fear dissipates with experience. The more you go through things, the less you're afraid of them you are. That's why he starts to recount the story. In thir verse 34, And David said to Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. Now, that's a, f that, you know, I don't know that I would do what David did. And he talks about how he goes and he takes him out of the mouth. And he, he grabs the bear by the beard and, sm you know, slaps him. I know he says he, he smote him, you know. This is why David was able to go fight this Philistine. Because he'd already gone through this type of thing before. Now, if you ask me, the Philistine is way scarier than the lion or the bear. Yeah. You know, that's my opinion. Because they're, I mean, a bear and a lion, you know, they have fangs and teeth and they're man ears and all that, but they're animals. You know, they don't have the intellect. They don't have, you know, you, you could fight them with, you know, with, a, with a, an implement or something. That you, you know, they hunt them in Africa. You know, they, it, you can take care of these animals. But a human being, it's, it's another story, especially one that's nine feet tall and has been a warrior from his youth, covered in brass, so on and so forth. But he's saying, look, I'm not afraid to go fight this guy. I've already done scary things before. And he says, thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took him out of his flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered out of his mouth. I believe he's talking about two different instances. He's talking about the one time a lion came and the other time a bear came. And he says, and, when, and, and I, I delivered him out of his mouth, and when he rose up against me, I caught him by his beard and slew him. I mean, he's reaching out and laying hands on this man-eater. It's just a boy. He's laying his hands on him, and then just, and it doesn't say how he slew him. I don't know if it was like Samson, where he just beat him with his own bare hands, who was another person who had what? The Spirit of the Lord come upon him. So that's where he got his boldness, was through having the Spirit of the Lord come upon him. And when the, that's why the Bible says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Look, when the spirit of God is, comes upon us, we're not going to be afraid of these things. These things shouldn't frighten us if we are full of, the, full of the spirit. You know what that tells me? People that are afraid of the battle are not filled with the spirit of God. Now, that there's, the, there's the sealing of the spirit and there's the filling of the spirit. We'll always be sealed by the spirit. We're, we're going to be God's people, God's children, until, you know, if we're saved until you know, forever. But there's a difference between being you know, sealed and being filled by the Spirit. And when you're filled with the Spirit, you know, fear isn't a thing for you anymore. And you're able to go through these experiences and gain experience. David's boldness to fight you know, came from his past victories that he won through the Spirit of the Lord. And that's why people, when, they, you know, when, when, when we come against, into these battles, that's not the time to, to turn tail and run away. Because next time, it's going to take even less. Next time, it's going to take even less for the devil to win the next battle. You know, next time, he's not going to have to send Goliath, you know. You know, if, if David had run from the, the lion and the bear, next time, he's just going to, you know, maybe next time, the devil just needs to send, like, a squirrel. You know, I don't know, a, a wild dog. Right. You know, something way less intimidating than a lion and a bear. Because he knows, oh, he's afraid of this. So he knows that, you know, it doesn't take much. Here's the thing, the small battles, those are the things that prepare us for the big battles, aren't they? You know, we should always be willing to go through those trials and, and the temptations, the battles that we're faced with. That's why it's important that we fight these fights, because they prepare us for the bigger ones that are coming. That's what it says in Romans chapter 5, where you are, right? Romans chapter 5, verse 3, it says, Not only so, but we glory in tribulations. It's like, look, we're glad when there's trouble. We're glad when there's tribulations. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And patient, patience, experience, and experience hope. You know, that's how David was able to go face that Philistine of Gath, Goliath. He was able to go fight him because he had experience. With what? With the lion and with the bear. He'd gone through these other, other battles earlier on in his life, you know. And now when it comes to this big battle, he says, well, I already know God's with me. Because I took on a lion and I took on a bear and he's going to, and what did he tell him? He shall be as one of them. You know, he looks, at, he looks at that big giant and says, oh, he's just a big kitty cat. 
and I'm just going to go grab him by his tail, you know, and wring his neck, basically. And the Bible says, you know, that, that patience, experience, and spirit, hope, these things work, you know, one works the other. And what does it say in verse 5? And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. How do you get that experience? You, go, you know, you've got to go through those experiences. Why? So that the Holy Ghost can empower you. You know, and I've said it before here recently, you know, God's not going to protect people that don't put themselves in harm's way. People want the protection of God, it's, but if you're not willing to go to the fight, you don't need it. Why is there any need to God protect you? You're not even in the battle. You're not even in the fight. God's not going to protect you. <clears throat> so don't avoid the little fights. The Bible says, and if you would go back to Ephesians where I had you, in Jeremiah chapter 12, if thou hast run with the footmen and they have wearied thee, then how can thou contend with the horses? And if in the land of peace, wherein thou trustest, they wearied thee, how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? He's saying, look, if these little things get to you, these little battles you lose, there's no way. Don't think you're going to make it for the big battles. People that are like, oh, you know, I, if I face the tribulation, if I go up against the Antichrist, I'm going to make it all the way. It's like, okay, well, stick around. You know, we'll see how you do when these little battles come up, when these little things come up, if, how, how, how shaken you are by that. That's very telling how you would actually do in that situation because at the end of the day, talk is cheap. <coughs> so, look, every generation has a battle to fight. Every generation has a giant to face. You know, every person here has, you know, probably has some kind of sin or something like that. Maybe not, you know, or... Or maybe one day might. I don't know. But I'm sure there's people in the room that have a Goliath in their life that they need to face and that they need to defeat. Every generation has a giant to face. And look, and you need, in order to fight that giant, you have to understand that he's real, that he's bold, and that he's bad. Right? He's tough. He's strong. The other thing you need to realize is that you can't use another person's armor to fight the battle. Look at verse 38. And Saul armed David. He says, okay, he convinced me. Or maybe he just enjoys watching a train wreck. Who knows? And he said, and Saul armor, armed David with his armor and put a helmet of brass upon his head. And he also armed him with a coat of mail. So he's like, all right, son, well, if you're going to go fight this, let me give you some armor. And he's putting all his armor on him. <clears throat> and David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And he said unto David, son of Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. So look, I can't use somebody else's armor to go fight this battle. Your armor must be alone. Are you still in Ephesians? Yep. Ephesians chapter 6. Look at verse 13. He says, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God. You know, every single one of us has to at some point put the armor on ourselves. Put our own, the armor that God has given us. Not another person's armor. We can't just stand in the shadow of other people's faith. Or stand, you know, I mean, there's, there's obviously there's a time and a season, you know, Children have to, you know, are protected by their parents and so on and so forth. There's examples of that. But every single person at some point has to say, this battle is mine. I'm going to put my armor on. I'm going to go fight this fight. That's what David was willing to do. And he's saying, look, you have to put on the whole armor of God that may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Standing, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. And he goes on and describes the armor that, you know, again, is a spiritual armor. This is a spiritual battle that we're talking about tonight. Not a physical one. <laughs> now, what I really love about this story, and again, there's just so much here in this story, and we could probably do you know, multiple sermons through this. And you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, God willing, I'll have other opportunities to preach sermons out of this chapter, but one thing I always love about this is, is, this, is, is the verse 40. You can go back there to 1 first, uh, first Samuel. You know, Dave, or David, you know, he's a great example to us of somebody who's willing to go face a giant. You know, he, he was understanding, first of all, he said, is there not a cause? And look, there's a cause today. And look, there will always be a cause. And it's not like we're going to get to some point in this life or in this world where the Christian, you know, we're, we're going to send up some, we're going to set up some kind of theocracy before Christ gets here and everyone's just going to be at peace with us. And that's never going to happen. There will be no peace until Jesus comes. Yeah, right. And until then, it's going to be a fight every step of the way. Yeah. You know, and David understood that. That there's a, there's a real fight that has to take place every generation. You know, and he was willing to, to, to put himself out there. But what I really love about David is that he wanted to go big. You know, David was seeing even beyond Goliath. 
And if you look there, it says in verse 40, And he took a staff in his hand, and he chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had. Now, why does he take five? Maybe, maybe he wasn't sure if he's going to make that first shot. I don't think that was it at all. I think if David had any hesitation about whether or not God was going to deliver him, he wouldn't have even gone. I think when David walked out of Saul's tent and went to go face that, that giant, he knew beyond a shadow of doubt, God's going to deliver him into my hand. Otherwise, how do you explain how bold he was? So he goes and he grabs, why did, but why does he grab five stones? I mean, how many stones did it take to drop Goliath? Just one. He just throws one stone at him, boom, right in the forehead, drops him. That's all it took. So why does he grab five? Well, if you remember earlier, we were talking about the fact that David had more than one giant in mind that day because of the fact that there were other giants, weren't there? There were the sons and his brothers, which comes to a total of five giants. He's taking five stones because he knows there's five. Maybe he didn't know, or maybe God's just showing us an illustration of how we ought to be. But I think David's like, you know what? I'm going to get Goliath, and then when we get over into their side, I'm going to find his kids. I'm going to find his brother. I'm going to take them all out. Who does he think he is just because he's big, walking around, strutting his stuff to defy God? Is there not a cause? I'll show him. That's what his attitude is. I'll show him who's boss. I'll kill him, and then I'm going to go after his, his, his kids that are just like him. I mean, they might have been grown men who were just as nasty as, as Goliath was at that point. And, his, and, you know, I'll take out their uncle too, you know, his brother. I believe that's what he's showing us here, is that David had an idea, had, the, had this mentality of going big for God. You know, and that's the mentality we all ought to have for God. And, and to go big. You know, that, and that, you know, it's just, it's so frustrating to see people who are short-sighted in their Christianity. who are just going to do a, a, the bare minimum for Christ. When all their, their, you know, their eternal rewards are hanging in the balance. <laughs> I mean, how many, let me ask you this. How many gold, how much gold, silver, and precious stones are you satisfied with in heaven? You know, just a little bit? Well, that's enough. That's enough. No, Lord, I don't need any more. I mean, can you imagine God trying to just reward you, and you're just like, no, I don't, I don't need any more. That's not my attitude. I don't think that's the attitude. You should say, I want all I can get. I want, if God's going to reward me in heaven, let's get all we can get. Let's go big. David wasn't just like, hey, you know, let me just take this one stone and get that one giant. He's like, I'm going to get them all. I'm going to get as many as God will let me. That's how many I'm going to take out. That's how many battles I'm willing to fight. And I remember, you know, and there's a lot of, in Christianity today, people that just want to quench that spirit. They don't like it when people talk like this. They talk about going big, doing something big for God. Well, I serve a big God. Yeah. I serve a God, you know, there, there's no limit to his power. There's nothing he can't do. Right. And God's looking to show himself strong on, on the behalf of those that, you know, will, will actually try to go do something big for God. So why aren't we trying to do something big for God? You know, and I would say that trying to knock every door in Tucson is a big work for God. That's why I love going to a church that has an idea of, you know, knocking every door in the state of Arizona. And people go, oh, you're just, you're just, who do you think you are? I'm nobody. You th who, does, who did David think he was? Nobody. Is that what David, is that his attitude? Oh, I'm going to go out there because I'm David. I've got the Spirit of the Lord and, you know. No, he went out, I'm going to go out, and you know, he said, the Lord shall deliver you into my hand. You know, I come to you in the, in the spirit of the Lord, in the name of the living God. That's who he came in, and that's, what, that, no, that's the attitude that I have, because that is the Great Commission. That's what we're commissioned here to do, to preach the gospel to every creature. Well, who does Jesus think he is to tell us that we should not, you know, tell every, give every person in the world the gospel? Well, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> He's God, maybe? I mean, if, if that wasn't a possibility, why would Jesus tell us to do it? Here, let me just give you this unattainable bar of preaching the gospel to every creature. But, you know, the vast majority of people, of Christians today, they sell that short. They say, oh, you know, I know you guys are soul winners and do a lot of soul winning, but every door, come on. You're not really going to do that. And I remember getting into a Baptist church early on in my Christian life, and I can't remember exactly how the conversation went. But I was, I mean, I, you know when a person first gets saved, they understand the gospel? I mean, I remember sitting there at a stoplight when I first got saved, and just watching cars go by, just a blur of faces, and just wondering, are they saved? Are they saved? Are they, you know, are they saved? You have a burden for people. You know, over time, you know, we can lose that, and that's, that's not good. You know, that can, we, that can go away. I mean, just being moved to tears, like, are these people saved? We've got to tell everybody about this. I remember going to a church and expressing that to a pastor, 
And him just saying, well, you know, when you're young, you just want to set the world on fire, but you'll learn. Just, I was like, oh, maybe he's right. He's older and wiser. You know what? He wasn't. He, he was short-sighted. He didn't have the vision that David had of going big for God. He'll say, oh, you're faithful. Are you really going to knock every door in Arizona? Yes. And this generation, we'll do it. I mean, we've knocked, <laughs> we've knocked, I mean, the majority of Phoenix. I mean, you realize that's like the fifth biggest city in America. And that's just with, you know, and in, I mean, the faithful word in Phoenix is bigger now, obviously, but it wasn't always that big. Seven years ago when I got here, they had even broken 100 once in their attendance records. And now they're running, you know, two, three, four hundred, whatever. And they're getting a lot more work done. But, you know, for a long time, the vast majority of that work got done by a smaller group of people. I mean, go look at the map. Look how much we've accomplished in two years. And there's, and there's not, we're not packed at the brim in here tonight, are we? It's a small group down here. But there's people here that want to go big for God. And don't ever feel like, well, you know, we're just going to knock at a, every door in the city of two million people. That's, that's a big task. You know, if, I, if someone's, hey, what do you want to accomplish with your life? I want to knock every door in Tucson. That's a big goal. That's a, that's, a worthy, that's a worthy calling in life, in my opinion. I want to preach the gospel to every single person I can in this city. Amen. And I want to go to the Indian reservations and do that. And we've knocked almost all those save the Navajo. Right. And then when we're done, you know what we'll do? We'll do it again. Amen. And then, you know, we'll get the whole state of Arizona. We'll start doing the small towns. Morency's almost done, folks. You know, we could, we could, this could happen if people understand that the battle's real and that they, they are involved as Christians in a spiritual warfare. And that warfare is one, you know, with the word of God, the sword of the spirit, and going out and rescuing people from hell. That is the battle that we're called to. And we need to, you know, not just take the one stone and say, oh, this is enough. I'll just go fight this one little battle here. We'll just knock our doors in our area code. You know, just the doors that are in our zip code. Just everybody in a five-mile radius will just, will just consistently knock those doors over and over. You know, churches that do that, they're, what they're really concerned with is just trying to get people to come to church. Right. That's really what, I mean, I'm sure they, they have a burden for souls and they want people to get saved. But the reason why they're not willing often to go beyond that is because they know once you go beyond a certain distance, people aren't going to come to your church. Right. I mean, we hear it all the time when we go down into the south side, don't we? Yeah. I mean, it's literally like a 10, 15-minute drive. Well, we're at churches over at Grant Silverbell. <laughs> You're all the way over here? I'm like, man, you city folks don't know what it's like. Living in nor a rural, rural Michigan, northern Michigan, is, it was 45 minutes anywhere. <laughs> it's like, I remember being a half hour, 45 minutes, one way to church and thought, this is normal. You know, but people, they had, that's why, and, but I'm saying is this, that's why a lot of churches, they don't, they don't want to go big because they know that there's, all they're going to accomplish is getting somebody saved. You know, that, and that's, you know, but that's, that's the motivation, to go out and get people saved. You know, I love that David had more than one giant in mind that day. He had an attitude that was, you know, willing to go big. And we know the story, right? In verse 41, And the Philistine came on and drew near unto him, and the man that bare the shield before him. And the Philistine looked and saw David and disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and a fair countenance. He says, You're prettier than me, right? Yeah. And the Philistine said unto David, I am a dog, am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I'll give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air, and the beasts of the field. Then da said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, and the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver me into thine hand. So that's why David's able to go out and fight this battle, because he knows that God is with him. And look, that's how we're going to fight our battles, in the Spirit of the Lord. If we're filled with the Spirit, if we're walking with God, the victory is ours. He says, And I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give thy carcasses to the, to the, to the host, excuse me, to the, and to, the, and to, the wild, to the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. Now, jump down to verse 51. I love this. In verse 50, So David prevailed over the Philistine and with the sling and with, the, and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood on the Philistine. I just love the picture that the Bible's showing us here. Because this actually happened. He drops him. He doesn't just, you know, do like the walk-off KO. Like, he like runs up there and jumps on top of his body in front of all the Philistines. 
and he draws his own sword. I mean, this guy's sword must have been huge. I'm just showing you that, you know, David was probably a pretty strong guy, even in his youth. And he takes this sword from his own sword, uh, drew it out of the sheath thereof, and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion, was, their dead was fled, they fled, and Israel rose and shouted and pursued with the Philistines until they'll come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. <clears throat> it says, And the wounded of the Philistines fell down. We'll just jump down to verse 54. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. And he put his armor in his tent. I mean, it wasn't, I mean, I love that he takes this guy's head. And I wish he could get a, I mean, if a guy's nine feet tall, just imagine that head. When I read this, do you ever just put yourself in these stories? I mean, being David, stands on just hearing the Israel, ah, there's just a battle cry, everyone's charging, Philistines are running away, and there's this slaughter. Man, I was born in the wrong time, I'm telling you. <laughs> right? But it, he takes this head. Can you just imagine grabbing that guy's head? It must have been huge. Just holding that thing up by his hair. You know, head cut off, all, <laughs> whatever. Just some gnarly looking face. And he takes that thing and he puts it in his tent. And you say, oh, how macabre. How, how dare he do that? What's wrong with him? You know what he wanted? He wanted some trophies. He wanted to be reminded of what God can do with an individual who just has a little bit of faith and is willing to put themselves out there and fight. That's what he wanted. And you know, that should be our motivation today. You know, don't end your life without some spiritual trophies. You should have some spiritual trophies in your life. I mean, you know, guys, we like to go out and hunt, and we like to get the, you know, the trophy buck, Amen. with the big rack, and we like to look at it and tell stories about how to. I worked my last boss. You know, he had in the in the showroom, he had all kinds of mount. I mean, he had elk. It was a shoulder mount coming out of the wall. It was just like, you know, this big horn. He had bears in there. In this tiny little space, but he just stuffed it with all kinds of, you know, antelope, and he had ducks, and he had, you know, you know bucks from Iowa, I and mean, he had all kinds of these big, and he, and you know how many times I've heard the same story about that antelope? <laughs> At least three or four times about how he belly crawled 100 yards, and <laughs> this one I shot, and I spine shot at him, I felt so, you know, he had all these stories, these trophies, right? And I guess, cool, you know, I'd love to have that too someday. You know what I want more than that? I want some spiritual trophies. Amen. I want to have a spiritual Goliath's head in my tent. I mean, let's say, I remember when God gave me the victory in that battle. Amen. I remember when God gave me the victory over that sin. The day I won, I knew I had it. That's what I want for my life. Amen. You know what? Some people will never have that in their Christian life, ever. Because they're not willing to fight. Because they're not willing to put themselves out there because the battle is hard. Because it's hard to, you know, to be a good soldier, to endure the hardness. Right. Look, if you want that spiritual trophy, you want that Goliath said in your tent, you want some that armor of his laying around so you can glory in. You know, you gotta, you gotta be willing to go through the fight. You know, but it's a lot of people they don't want to do that. They don't want to fight the Goliath of their generation. You know, every generation has the Goliath, but they also have the opportunity to see great things done for God and to win some amazing victories and see great things done for God. Maybe the world will never acknowledge it. You know, maybe the world's never going to come down here. You know, the, the local news team's never going to come in here and look at our map and look at the bulletin and say, wow, wow, look, at, look we got we to write this story. The whole world needs to know about how many souls are getting saved on a faith word in Tucson. Right. They're never going to do that. Right. But I get excited about it. Yeah, amen. I look at it and say, that's a spiritual trophy back there. Right. These are spiritual trophies in this, you know, because people are really are getting saved. Yeah. And you know what? The ultimate trophies will come in heaven. Right. When God starts handing them out, and you know, and every man shall have praise of God. But you know what? You don't get any of that. You know, like, nobody gets that without a fight. Amen. Without going out there and, and putting in the effort. So that's my encouragement to you tonight out of this chapter is, you know, every generation has a giant to face. And every one of us has a giant to face in, in the Christian life. Face it. You know, go out and fight it. And the Spirit of the Lord, you know, and God will give you the victory. And he'll even, you know, give and give, and then you'll have a trophy like David has. Go ahead and pray.